today I'm going to talk to you a bit about energy in South Africa, um, focusing largely on the electricity sector um, and how the sector is likely to transition in the future. Um, so the title of my presentation is A Story Unfolding, um, and you'll see why in a bit uh, in the sense of, um, as with in the case of Vietnam, there's still this debate about which direction South Africa um, will be going We'll work, we'll be going in, um, and it's actually a very critical time um, for policymakers in terms of making the right decisions. So historically and even today, um, coal remains the main fuel source for energy in South Africa. Uh, in 2015, it was about 73% of primary energy use. Um, the power sector is also highly dependent on coal, um, with coal accounting for 74% of capacity and 82% of total generation. Um, the power sector is therefore the largest consumer of coal in the country, consuming around 120 million tonnes each year. Um, there are other um, key demanders of coal in the country, uh, such as uh, liquid fuel sector, um, as well as industry. Um, so historically, uh, planning, well, not just historically, but planning in uh, South Africa in terms of electricity capacity has continued to focus on coal as a primary source of generation. Um, so the graph on uh, the left, which is this one over here, uh, shows you the integrated resource plan um, in 2010 for South Africa. Um, and the graph on the right shows you the plan uh, for 2016. Um, so the integrated resource plan is essentially government's electricity plan uh, for um, electricity production in the country. Um, and while the 2016 um, IRP has been released, uh, the 2010 uh, plan still remains the official plan of government um, as the 2016 plan was not approved. Um, but what you can see from the two graphs is that uh, coal is still dominant in 2020 and still plays a very important role in 2030 according to official government plans. Um, what the, if you compare the 2010 and the 2016 um, IRPs, what you can also see is that um, the amount of capacity that's expected to be added um, has come down, um, and that's because uh, electricity demand in South Africa has decreased over the last 10 years, um, as electricity prices have increased by almost 350%. Um, the increase in electricity prices was driven by um, coal and labor costs, and then also runaway capital costs of coal power um, production capacity bills. Um, Another important um, point to highlight is that um, <clears throat> the decline in demand in South Africa for, um, for electricity, um, along with the additional uh, commitment to build uh, another two coal power stations, um, has actually resulted in a surplus of electricity supply in the country, um, where the existing capacity is able to meet demand um, up until 2025. So while planning has focused on coal, um, renewable energy resources have been included in the official plans. Um, and this has taken place through um, the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program. It's a very long, long word, um, which is a bidding program essentially for private investment into renewable energy. Um, the private generation of electricity is then sold to the National Electricity Operator, ESCOM, which then uh, further sells it on to customers. So to date, there's been four bid windows um, and two smaller bid windows, um, which has resulted in an additional capacity of about 6.8 um, gigawatts. Um, not all of this, um, however, is operational. Currently, only around 3.8 gigawatts is operational. Um, however, the the, RIP, the RI4P program has resulted in um, significant declines in the prices of wind and solar PV in South Africa um, from the first um, bid round window in 2011 um, to the most recent window in 2015. And what we saw in terms of the prices that came from the bid round windows in 2015 was that wind and solar was actually now competitive with uh, new build uh, cost estimates for other technologies such as coal, nuclear, gas and gas. Um, so further adding sort of to the argument that um, that now renewable energies, it, it is a competitive technology for electricity generation in the country. Um, in addition to um, 
or rather with RAI4P program um, has also um, tried to um, do in the country is to um, place a significant focus on the localization of renewable energy industry. Um, and it's done this through minimum requirements um, for bidders. Um, and this has actually led to the development of several manufacturing companies um, in South Africa. Um, however, last year there was um, a delay uh, in the national regulator signing um, the new um, RI4P programs, which actually resulted in many of these manufacturing companies um, closing down. Um, so what we can take away from this is that in order for us to build up any sort of um, uh, benefits associated with, you know, with renewable, renewability in terms of localization, um, a firm commitment from government is required. Um, costs of renewable energy in the country is also expected to continue to decline. Um, so uh, estimates um, from the Energy Research Center at the University of Cape Town shows that under conservative assumptions, um, solar and PV costs, um, solar PV and wind costs uh, would decline by 35% and 18% by 2050, um, whereas under um, optimistic assumptions, um, that's uh, largely uh, regarding uh, faster learning rates, we could see um, solar PV and wind costs come down to by 58% um, and 37% uh, to 2050. This is already after the significant declines in prices that we've seen. Um, so South Africa is also reported to have some of the best solar resources in the world, um, resulting in um, high solar PV energy yields. Um, so this is uh, evident in the picture which is illustrated over here on the left, uh, where darker shades of red show higher potential kilowatt uh, production levels. Um, so about 220 gigawatts of potential has already been identified um, in what is called renewable energy development zones. So these are um, geographical areas that have been gazetted by government to be sort of hubs for uh, renewable energy expansion in the country. Um, however, um, 72 gigawatts of solar PV, um, uh, a rooftop solar PV has also been um, identified um, in South Africa. Um, so this suggests that potential in terms of solar PVs, almost 300 gigawatts. Um, and to place that into context, South Africa's um, entire power system is only 40 gigawatts. So there is a significant amount of resource. Um, similarly with wind, um, there's also a large potential um, for, for wind power generation um, with between 55% and 65% of uh, South Africa's land area um, being deemed technically uh, recoverable uh, with wind capacity exceeding 35%. Um, so in addition to having these resources, uh, we find that the supply of solar PV and wind when they're combined is also very or highly complementary um, to uh, electricity demand in the country. Um, so the graph um, presented over here shows the demand uh, coverage factors uh, for South Africa and for Denmark. And what you can see is that for 50% um, of the weeks in the year, um, you have a very good um, a, 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 uh, the uh, demand coverage factor um, typically matches um, ideally or very well. Um, so it implies that um, including a balanced combination of variable wind and solar PV um, into the South African power generation mix um, will not contribute significantly to rapid fluctuations in the power system. Um, so this slide shows uh, three recent studies that were done on optimal um, power generation planning in South Africa. Um, so they cover the studies of uh, Wright, uh, et al, Mervyn, um, and Lieber. Um, Wright and Lieber uh, use extensive adequacy, adequacy testing um, at very high temporal resolution um, and only consider the electricity sector in the, in the model that they use. Um, whereas Mervyn's, um, in the case of the paper by Mervyn, uh, the re resolution isn't as detailed, um, but it does consider the full energy system. Um, and sort of one of the key findings, or one of the key things that comes out of comparing these three papers is that, one, um, there's a larger role for variable renewable energy in South Africa. Um, based on the papers by Wright and Reber, we see that um, this is also sort of it's also a um, 
it's a, it's technically feasible because they are, these models are at such a deeper resolution. Um, and then the the third point um, to make from from this is that. Um, The uh, solar PV and re uh, so um, no real new capacity is needed um, over the medium term to 2025. Um, and these models are also producing very similar results in terms of what the optimal mix, mix or the least cost generation mix for South Africa is um, likely to be. Um, so generally what we see is that um, capacity expands by 4 gigawatts uh, in the case of wind and 3 gigawatts in the case of solar PV um, after 2025 uh, to 2040. Um, so in the paper by Mervyn, um, solar PV and wind capacity reaches 20% and 16% of total capacity uh, by 2030. And if we compare that to sort of the most recent government plan, um, which was quite optimistic for government plans on renewable energy, um, they've only saw the potential for 9% and 13% uh, by 2030. Um, so what does this mean in terms of generation? Um, so it equates to about 68% of total generation by 2050. Um, and other studies that have um, considered more optimistic prices um, than the studies uh, by, by Mervyn and others um, have actually, and they've also included the endogenous, endogenous retirement of coal power stations. So coal power stations um, uh, they closed down before reaching uh, the end of life. Um, have actually shown that you know, the contribution of variable renewable energy to total generation in South Africa could be as high as 80% by 2050. Um, so I'm just going to focus a bit on the work that was done by Mervyn um, and others. Um, and what they looked at was um, the impact of constraining um, solar PV and wind inclusion in electricity planning, which is what, or rather has been the way government has approached it thus far, um, to a case where um, one allows basically for a true optimal um, cost plan. Um, so in the case of where um, the capacity or additional capacities from solar PV and wind are limited per annum, um, the, graph show, the green line of the graph shows us the electricity price um, in that scenario. And the blue line shows us um, the electricity price in a true least cost scenario. Um, and what you can see is that um, when you remove these cap limits on how much solar PV and wind can be added, there are significant gains that can be made um, in terms of electricity prices in the country. Um, so by 2013 and 2050, we see that the electricity price is 6% and 13% uh, lower, respectively. Um, and in a, a country uh, such as South Africa, where we've already seen the significant or rapid rising of electricity prices, um, a slowing down in trajectory is, uh, is definitely um, what we'd want. Um, so one of the um, models that was sort of developed or that was developed under the UNU wider program, um, so this was developed by the Energy Research Center with UNU wider and the National Treasury of South Africa, was the development of a linked energy economic model. Um, so the model combines the uh, Energy Research Center's um, bottom-up energy model uh, with the National Treasury's eSage model, um, which is a dynamic uh, computable general equilibrium model. Um, so what this framework allows for is that the strengths of each model um, can be maintained uh, while suggesting some of the uh, disadvantages or weaknesses of each model uh, in trying to do sort of analysis of energy systems um, and economic development. Um, so to give you an example, in the case of the energy model, um, the demand for uh, electricity or rather economic growth is generally an exogenous variable, um, so it doesn't change over time. So regardless of what happens to electricity prices, um, depending on your generation mix, there's no impact on, there's no behavioral impact or behavioral response to changes um, in terms of electricity demand. But by linking the um, energy and the economic models, we now have this interaction. Um, so the way the, the models work, um, so uh, the, um, so the economic model uh, passes on, um, the economic passes, 
economic model passes information on to the energy model with regards to uh, economic growth by sector and then also household income growth. Um, the energy model would then use this information to determine what energy demand is likely to look like based on um, expectations regarding efficiency improvements, etc. Um, and then it solves optimally um, for an electricity mix uh, that would meet uh, the required level of demand. Um, the outcomes from this model, which include um, the expenditure um, plan or the uh, investment plan required for the electricity sector, um, as well as the electricity price, and also any sort of behavioral changes on energy um, demanded, is passed from the energy model to the economic model. Um, so that allows for the economic model to then solve for um, the growth path. Um, of the country. Um, and these models sort of, they, they are done um, iteratively over time, uh, such that the, the models converge and you have a solution where you um, actually, um, you have an optimal um, energy um, mix for the country, and you also understand what the economic implications of, of that mix is. And it's, it's a very powerful tool for analyzing changes in technology mix, looking at different government plans, but also for um, understanding um, climate change and the, the impacts of um, meeting emissions um, or emission targets in South Africa. So we used the LINK model um, to um, further the work that was done uh, by Mervyn. Um, uh, so Mervyn's work was done in a purely energy model, and now we've used the, the economic model to see, well, what is the economic impacts of increasing um, renewable energy in South Africa? Um, we did it for conservative as well as optimistic renewable energy prices. Um, so that's the blue and the yellow bars, respectively. And what we find is that increased uh, variable renewable uh, or the increase of renewable energy in the technology mix in South Africa can actually lead to higher um, growth and employment in the country. Um, but this is dependent on um, the availability of labor resources in the country. So we, 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 would, we need to make sure that the skills that are required to enter into the sector is available um, um, to, meet, to meet the demand. Um, so generally, we find that these positive impacts extend across sectors in the uh, in the country. Um, although the coal mining production um, sector uh, does experience a decline and a loss in in employment, um, we also see that there's higher welfare impacts um, across uh, all groups of households. Um, the shift from coal to renewables also allows for significant declines in emissions. Um, so this graph shows us um, the electricity sector uh, emissions um, in South Africa under, under a scenario of increased renewable energy. And you can see that power sector emissions decrease from about 250 uh, metric ton to about um, 100 by 2050. And this decreases the share of um, the electricity sector's contribution to emissions from 55% to 28%. Um, so in a different piece of work that was done, but which also looked at um, including the most recent costs on solar PV and wind for South Africa, um, what we actually see, um, so the graph of here shows you uh, emissions by sector um, in the country, um, and the red dotted line shows you sort of the upper limit um, and the lower limit of uh, government's national um, uh, nationally determined contribution. Um, and what it's showing us is that purely by just considering or switching to renewable energy, this is without any additional mitigation policy um, being added by government, um, South Africa has the ability to reach its um, peak, peak, upper peak plateau and decline commitments um, in, from 2020 um, and almost reach the median of that commitments. And that's purely just with reducing emissions in the power sector. So um, more recently, um, the South African government has released an integrated resource plan for 2018. Um, and for the first time, one of the scenarios that were provided was provided by the plan was actually a least cost generation mix, which is awesome because they're actually looking at that now before it was very much sort of capping certain technologies. Um, and this graph shows um, the um, 
government's 2018 IRP relative to the previous three studies that I showed. And what you can see is that the least cost option, even under government planning, uh, aligns quite well um, with the studies that have been done. Um, I think relatively just, um, or rather compared to uh, the CSIR and, um, or the, sorry, this is um, the paper that was by Wright and by Mervyn, um, they've got a bit more uh, solar um, than what is expected in the in the 2018 IRP, which has uh, a bit more gas, but that's uh, more in line with um, what NRL was expecting, or the paper by Debert, rather. Um, okay, so that being said, they have acknowledged the least cost optimization scenario. The recommended plan, however, that was put forward by government is to continue to cap solar PV and wind. Um, and they find that the investment cost of doing this is higher, um, but they also, um, their reasoning for doing this is uh, to provide more time for a, a social change or a, more time for development in the country. Um, but that plan is still, um, has not yet been finalized. It's still undergoing a two month public consultation period in which hopefully we'll be able to change their minds to remove these caps that they would like to include and allow for um, a lease cost or two lease cost um, electricity system in the country. Okay, so just the three sort of key messages from my presentation is large amounts of renewable energy can be included in South Africa. Um, it decreases emissions, and we find that we no longer face this trade of about cleaner energy um, and economic development. Cleaner energy can actually lead to economic development, particularly if we try and localize these, these industries within the country. Um, a very really important um, topic, of, important and popular topic in South Africa now is, well, what does this mean for coal mining communities in South Africa? Because you've got certain areas in South Africa that are, are completely based on um, the coal mining activity. Um, and because coal mines are negatively impacted um, by coal, uh, by the decrease in coal demand for the electricity uh, sector, um, government does need to think about a transition plan and how it can mitigate um, negative effects on, on the sector. However, just to add to that, um, a paper that was done by uh, Burton um, and others in 2018 has shown that the coal mining sector in South Africa is already facing significant challenges. Uh, it's got rising coal costs, rising transport costs, um, electricity is becoming, uh, well, rising electricity costs as well. And then also there's a significant risk from the global environment in terms of a decrease in demand for exports. Um, so while we can't say that the coal mining sector decline is inevitable, that's a bit of a strong statement to make, it is a very high likelihood. And it is something that the South African government needs to start thinking about in terms of how do we transition um, away from coal um, and how do we sort of minimize the impact on these communities. Um, and then lastly, we've got the 2018 uh, integrated, integrated Resource Plan, which acknowledges um, the important role of renewable energy, um, but yet continues uh, to cap uh, the inclusion of solar PV and wind to 2030. Um, yeah. And that's me. Thank you.